come to Bonn. So there's always exciting things happening. Uh, so the title is Hyperholomorphic Sheaves. Sorry for the bad quality of <laughs> erasing. Can you see, or is it too bad? Uh, and the formations of K3 surfaces. Generalize the formations. And the, ex the, relation, the reason why the, the, the we have a, the, formation, the relationship to the formation of K3 surfaces was explained by Sukendu's talk. So I really will talk mostly about hyperholomorphic shifts. And uh, the, the, OK, so uh, let me uh, def uh, set up some definitions. Uh, and uh, a lot of what I'll say is joint work with Sukendu. Some of it predates our collaboration. Uh, so <coughs> uh, let X, my, uh, in Sukendu's talk, X was a K3 here. Uh, X is a hyperkeller, higher dimensional usually. Uh, this would denote the formation of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on the K3 usually. Let X be a Keller manifold now, right now. So I, I'm going to, uh, the, first, uh, the first topic will be hyperholomorphic sheaves. Hyperholomorphic sheaves. But my sheaves will be sheaves of Azubaya algebra. So, uh, so definition to uh, a reflexive sheaf sheaf A of Azumaya, it's a reflexive coherent sheaf A of Azumaya algebras over X um, is a coherent OX module A together. with a unit, a global section one, and associative multiplication from A tensor A to itself, such that Locally, it's the, uh, A is the endomorphism bundle, and this is the composition, such that uh, X admits a covering an open covering U alpha uh, and reflexive sheaves. Uh, F alpha over U alpha and isomorphisms uh, eta alpha from the restriction of A to the endomorphism of uh, F alpha. Uh, maybe I'll write uh, uh, with unit and with identity and of F. And uh, these are isomorphisms of associative algebra. So that's uh, So this is just another way of talking about twisted sheaves, and we'll always talk about, uh, assume that the sheaves are reflexive. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, so there are two annoying things here. Uh, first, that 
I'm talking about uh, reflexive rather than locally free. That's another one technicality. The second technicality is that I'm talking about Azumai algebras or twisted sheaths rather than regular sheaths. So why bother? So I'll try to explain why, uh, why bother. We are more or less forced to do it to have a single interesting example of a, of a hyperholomorphic sheath over a higher dimensional a hyperkähler variety. So, uh, so this will... Uh, No, that's not true in our case. No, we're not, we're not doing real access. What? Yeah, actually, these are all interesting questions. What are the higher x? And they are actually complicated. And they were calculated in our examples. All right. So, uh, so then uh, there is a notion of stability. So, uh, definition, uh, let uh, maybe, maybe, uh, 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 um, so, you know, if you have, uh, if you have a sub sheaf of, so lo let's look at an, on an open set. You have a sheaf F alpha, coherent sheaf. If you have a sub sheaf, you get the, the sub algebra of, of, uh, and F, uh, which uh, send the subshift to itself, leaving the subshift invariant. So it's, uh, it's uh, lo you know, in local coordinate, it will look like this, right? And uh, in, uh, in Lie algebra, these are called maximal parabolic subalgebra, these block triangular. So and uh, this is defined locally, but now uh, globally, it makes sense for an Azumaya algebra to talk about a maximal parabolic subalgebra. So locally, it just preserves the subshifts. And this uh, is uh, the language you need in order to define stability. So let uh, omega be a Keller class on X. Uh, so a, a, a sheaf A of Azumaya algebras is a omega slope stable uh, if so f uh, the following two conditions hold one is that every every non trivial uh, proper non zero <coughs> Subsheaf P of maximal parab uh, inside A of uh, so you see A is uh, A has slope zero uh, the uh, the slope of uh, the the omega slope of A is necessarily zero the first Jung class of A is zero uh, every uh, proper non-zero subsheaf of maximal parabolic subalgebras. Uh, has a negative slope because uh, you know this block will have a zero slope, this block will have a zero slope, and this will be a map from the quotient to the sub, so it will have negative slope. So um, and two, this uh, should follow from one, but I don't know if uh, it has been proven. Uh, Uh, so I, uh, I'll say a word about it. So the second thing is that A itself, so you know if A is, uh, Azumai algebras has brow have Brouwer classes, and it could be maximally twisted. So it is actually very, uh, could be the case, and in our case it will be often and useful, that A doesn't have uh, any parabolic subshift. That means that the uh, twisted, uh, twisted shifts whose Brouwer classes, the order of the Brouwer class is equal to the rank, doesn't have any subshift. So this sometimes is just almost uh, you get for free. But the question is, does this slope stability 
give you what you want from Young Mills theory, that the existence of a emission me uh, metric and so on. So we need it, so we assume it, is, it would be part of the assumption. Uh, a uh, as a shift, forgetting the po uh, multiplication, as a coherent shift is uh, omega uh, polystable, slope polystable. And uh, there is a proposition that uh, if, uh, if the Brouwer class uh, Brou uh, has an order equal to the rank, then one implies two. But I don't know if it's true in more generality. OK, so then, uh, then uh, we can define what is a hyperholomorphic sheaf. Uh, it's an ad hoc definition. I want, uh, the definition is very differential geometric. But uh, then you prove that the, the well, I'll give you an equivalent definition according to Verbitsky. So let x be an irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold. So these are the hyperkeller ones. Okay, it's an acronym. So irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold. Uh, should I define this? I'll be happy to do so. So these are uh, simply connected Keller manifolds, uh, which are which such that uh, it has a, such that the vector space of global holomorphic two forms is one dimensional, spanned by a, a, a symplectic form, everyone on the generated form. So <coughs> these are like the uh, smooth projective modular space of sheaves on a K3, this, uh, or the generalized Kuhn. So, uh, and let A be a sheaf of Azumaya algebras over x. Um, uh, uh, we say that, uh, so omega will be a killer class, that A is omega <coughs> hyperholomorphic. Oh, I forgot to say something. Uh, uh, okay, a uh, hyperholomorphic if uh, two things uh, happen, maybe A, um, so A is omega slope stable, according to the previous definition. And B, so associated to the Keller class, uh, omega, we have the Twistor family. So this has been used already in two talks. But uh, the way it works is maybe I'll briefly explain that given a Keller class, cohomology class, there is a unique Keller form such that the complex structure on, so we start with x, such that the complex structure on x and the Keller form, uh, they give you a metric which is hyperkeller, so they determine a metric. You know, any two of these three pieces of data determine the third, uh, the, um, which is hyperkeller. That means that you have, um, you have uh, three complex structures i, j, and k on x that satisfy the quaternionic uh, relations. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, any linear combination a, i, plus b, j, plus c, k, with a square plus b square plus c square equal 1 is an compl integrable complex structure. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and so you get a sphere of complex structures, which is a P1. So this is the sphere of complex structures. And uh, so you get a, 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 a family um, such that uh, given a, a point here, the fiber will be x, the same x, but endowed with this complex structure. So this is the twist of family. It depends on the choice of the Keller class, canonically. 
Uh, and, and the second condition is, so this is the twist of family. So let this be the twist of family. Then the condition is that C2, mentioned already in uh, Sukhendu's talk, C2 of A, this is a, a class. It's an integral class. The base is simply connected. So uh, all the co second cohomology of all, all fiber can be identified with the second cohomology of X. So it means it, we know what it means, uh, C2 of A everywhere. Uh, it's the flat deformation with respect to the Gaussman in connection. And this remains of Hodge type 2, 2. With respect, uh, uh, along the twist of deformation. And then there is a, so this, so this is certainly a necessary condition to be able to deform the Azumaya algebra along, uh, along, the, uh, along the twist of the formation. But there is a theorem of Verbitsky. This is a very powerful, it's the most powerful uh, deformability result, I think, in the theory of hyperkeller manifold. So there is a theorem of Verbitsky. Uh, it says that let uh, A, it's a generalization of a theorem of Verbitsky. Let A be, but it's really due to Verbitsky. It's written in uh, one of my papers, but I consulted Verbitsky to write it. <laughs> let A be a, 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 an omega hyperholomorphic. Chief of Azumaya algebras, algebras over, uh, you know, a hyperkeller X endowed with a Keller omega, and uh, this the twist of family. Then there exists and it's essentially canonical a, a, a sheaf oh and the twist of family is also a complex manifold a sheaf a, a tilde of Azumaya algebras. over uh, uh, the whole twist of family. Uh, and here, so you have the special point with corresponding to the initial complex structure, I. Over it, you have x, uh, s uh, such that uh, it restricts to x as a. So we can deform a along the twist of the formation. Uh, so, so Now I will give an example. You ask? Yeah. Is it the twist of sheep or is it the brow? Now, and so, okay. So note that condition B here, that C2 of A remains of Hodge type 2, 2, is automatic if X is a K3 surface. Because then you are working with H4, which is uh, uh, spanned by a uh, 2, 2 class. But in higher dimension, this is a very restrictive condition. And except for the tangent bundle, which is easy to deform anyway, there are, uh, until uh, this uh, uh, example was uh, verified, there was no interesting example. So when I said there are two technicalities, uh, this is the flexibility we need to come up with a single interesting example. So you're paying a price in order to have an example. All right, so 
It's not for the sake of generality. We really need this uh, setup in order to construct interesting uh, algebraic cycles or, or interesting sheets. All right, so, uh, so, so the shift E I'll, I'll recall, so this is the uh, second shift E over the self product of a moduli space. This is from, uh, fortunately, so can we use the same uh, letter? So uh, let S be a K3, uh, uh, H. So the, if this is a, S could be. A non-projective, if we are talking about Hilbert schemes, otherwise <coughs> um, uh, you take a class, a ample, uh, sorry, V first is a Mukai vector. So I'll denote by Ks, this is the topological K group. And uh, if you uh, take Cheren character times the square root of Todd, you get an isomorphism with the integral cohomology that uh, Mukai uses. But it really is uh, uh, easy to work with the topological k group. It's the same thing. Uh, you know, a class, uh, a topological vector bundle is determined by its rank and chunk classes. So uh, S is the class here. All right, so let S be a k3, V a class, and H. Uh, v generic polarization. Uh, um, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, we, we need a V indivisible or primitive. And uh, we want C1V uh, of type 1, 1. So it's an algebraic class. Uh, integral algebraic um, uh, generic polarization. And then we get the moduli space MHV. And by results of many people, uh, O'Grady, uh, Mukai, uh, Hubert, and uh, Yoshioka, finally, this is the formation equivalent to the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on, on uh, S. And, uh, and uh, over, so now let, now I will, here I will defer, I'm sorry, but I, I have to, so let, U, this will denote the universal shift of uh, the moduli space. Uh, and I'll start calling this by M <coughs> for short. Uh, be the universal shift. It could be twisted, but assume that it exists for simplicity now. So this would be the ideal shift of the universal subscheme. M is the Hilbert scheme. And, uh, and so over, so we have um, M cos S cos M, and we have uh, pi 1, 2 into M cos S, uh, pi 1, 3 into M cos M, and pi 2, 3 into S cos M. We have U here. And we'll take u dual here, and uh, we'll uh, convolve them. Basically, we want to. Uh, so this we, you are thinking about these as correspondences of Fourier-Mukai kernels. So you want to uh, take the convolution of u with u as Fourier-Mukai kernels. This will belong to the derived category of m cos m, uh, and this is uh, you know you. This is a pi 1, 3 lower star of pi 1, 2 upper star u, and so pi 2, 3 upper star u dual. And you push forward, and again, everything is derived. Uh, I'll call this f, this object. I think uh, this is the, so can we use the same? And now, uh, so the cohomology sheaves of this object uh, uh, H naught of F, uh, maybe H I of F is just the X. Oh, uh, in Sukendu, this was shifted, but I'm ignoring shifts now. It's X, it's the relative X I, pi 1, 3, 
uh, of uh, pi 1, 2, u, oh, I guess uh, I should have uh, switched. Uh, pi 2, 3, u. Right, this is, uh, these are the relative x. So let's see what we get. So, so let f1 and f2, questions? Uh, be a point in m cos m. So these are two uh, stable, h stable sheaves with class V. Uh, and suppose that they are not isomorphic, so as points that are different. So I'm, I'm using the same notation for the isomorphism class and for the sheaf itself. Uh, then, uh, and then what do we have? Then we have harm from f1 to f2 is 0, uh, both stable and not isomorphic. Uh, and for the same reason, by cell duality, x2 from f1 to f2 is 0, because it's dual to home from f2 to f1. And so this, and now remember that the, the alternating sum of the x i's is minus v v, the pairing of, the Mukai pairing of v with itself. So we get that x1, f1, f2, uh, the dimension is uh, minus v v, uh, Sorry, is V V. <laughs> uh, and so minus X one is equal to the, uh, the alternating sum, uh, which is uh, minus V V. So and uh, uh, by definition of the Mukai pairing. And uh, and this is equal to uh, the dimension of M minus 2, and I will always uh, denote this by 2n. So if, uh, if m is the Hilbert scheme of n points, the dimension is 2n. So n will always be half the dimension of m. Okay. So we see, so from this, we see that actually uh, x 0 pi 1, 3 of the, the, uh, which is uh, the h naught of f is 0. Uh, it's easy to see that uh, this for, uh, implies the vanishing uh, of the whole uh, direct image. x1, um, I'll call this e. This is our e of, uh, of pi 1, 3. Uh, so I'll, I'll repeat the definition because I'm defining E, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, locally free uh, 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 restricts to a locally free sheaf of rank uh, VV maybe, and now I'll use 2 and minus 2, over m cos m minus the diagonal, uh, right? Because, and, uh, because, um, and, uh, and what about x2? It's easy to see that uh, x2 pi 1, 3 of the same thing, which is the, the second cohomology, or a shift cohomology of the complex f, this is uh, isomorphic to the structure shift of the diagonal. And so uh, you see that, uh, as before, f is an extension of this e by a destruction of the diagonal, like in Sukendu's talk. And so my next goal is to show that, oh, uh, is to show that e is hyperholomorphic. And that's the unique, the only <laughs> interesting example I know, except the tangent bundle in higher dimensions. So now I get to play with water. Actually, to 
would be more interesting to play with fire, but <laughs> <laughs> for you, <laughs> you are used to this. <laughs> I guess this is a, an old joke here. Okay, so, uh, so we have E, and, uh, and uh, we have a question whether, how am I doing the time? Bad. <laughs> okay, so to show that, I just erased the definition of a hyperholomorphic sheaf, but to show, <laughs> to show that uh, this E is hyperholomorphic, we need to show that it's stable, and we need to show that the C2 remains of type, of Hodge type 2, 2, along a uh, twist of deformation. So, so uh, the next thing is stability. Of E. Uh, and again, uh, Sukendu mentioned this result. I'll state it again. So, there are two ways to pr uh, that I know to prove that this shift is stable. Uh, so, uh, let me uh, state a proposition. So, first. This is true for any moduli space in this setting. Uh, so first of all, E is a reflexive sheet. And uh, two, it's technical. Uh, so let uh, beta for, uh, like in uh, Sukendu's talk, uh, this would be the blow up of the diagonal. And uh, so we take, we pull back, uh, let, uh, so uh, we'll have the, uh, the following picture. So we have, here we have the exceptional divisor over this. This is beta. Um, this would be the, proje the natural map. And remember that this is the projectivization of the normal bundle of the diagonal, which is the same as the tangent bundle of the, the diagonal. And, uh, uh, and uh, all right, so, so I said let V, uh, so this would be a vector bundle, uh, if this would be on sheaf on Y first, You'll pull back the, the sheaf E. You'll tensor it with OY with this line bundle, the exceptional divisor. And now this actually have torsion. You are pulling back a reflection sheaf, reflexive sheaf, so modu modulo torsion. This uh, is locally free. So this resolves the the singularities of the shift E, moreover, you have, you have a, a, the transposition of the factors, M cos M, which leads to, a, to a, an involution, tau tilde, on Y. Now, look at uh, ha, ha, what happens when you, uh, when you interchange the roles of F1 and F2 by cell duality on the K3. These are X1 of F1, F2, and X1 of F2, F1 are dual, right? So the fibers of E uh, at the two points, uh, F1 away from the diagonal, and F2, F1 uh, are dual, the fibers. These, these are. It's locally free there, away from the diagonal, and with your fibers by cell duality, right? I expect a lot of nodes. <laughs> so, so um, now along the diagonal, complicated things happen. But in fact, 
Uh, when you, once you, that's why I normalize uh, by, uh, you can ask why bother about this, just a line bundle. It will stay locally free even without this factor, but the pullback via the involution of V is isomorphic to V dual. Away from the diagonal, this is clear, and now if you normalize it this way, this is uh, also persists across the diagonal. And the uh, three, oh, this is three, what you say? Uh, oh yeah, this is three and four. Uh, so remember, uh, Manfred asked if we have some, uh, no, but uh, four, uh, um, uh, because for it to be symplectic, it needs to be isomorphic to itself, not to its uh, pullback under. But along the diagonal, you are, uh, uh, tau tilde fix, uh, point, fixes pointwise uh, the point of the exceptional divisor. So V restricted to the exceptional divisor is isomorphic to its dual. And in fact, I need to uh, say, so this is symplectic, but I need to uh, say something. So over. Over, uh, over this space, I have the pullback of the tangent bundle of the, of, the, of the diagonal, which is isomorphic to the cotangent bundle via the, because this is symplectic M. And we also have here now, since uh, this is uh, the pullback of the vector bundle to its projectivization, it has a tautological line sub bundle of minus one, right? So uh, here, and I'll, I'll also call it here, the, I'll call it L. This is the O of minus one. O D minus one. The tautological line sub bundle. And so V restricted to D is isomorphic to the symplectic orthogonal of L with respect to, so this is symplectic. It's a pullback of symplectic structure on the diagonal. Modulo, uh, L. Remember that the rank of E is 2 and minus 2? This rank is 2 and minus 2. This is symplectic, this is symplectic, and they are uh, isomorphic. So this is useful for the proof of stability, so we will now use it. So theorem uh, let S be a, a again, who uh, can do mention it? Let S be. Uh, K3 surface, remember we want to prove that E is, or uh, the Azumaya algebra and E is omega slope stable. This is equivalent if over a Hilbert scheme, okay, let's see, be a K3 surface, which is uh, n very non algebraic, such that pick <coughs> S is trivial. And let, uh, so our M will be now SN. And so we have E over M cos M. So we have E, I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, the same construction. And uh, we have N E, and slope stability of N E, which is our previous A, is the same as slope stability of E. It's a shift, it's not twisted, so why not talk about E now? Then E is a omega slope stable. with respect to every Keller class uh, on, on the product S and this is, in fact, we will show that it ha doesn't have any subsheets, <laughs> not real subsheets, this E. But, yeah. So, so it was A was N E. Yes. But now, is, now the universal shift is the, the ideal shift of the universal sub subscheme. It's not twisted, so why not talk about it? Yeah, in the, by definition, I had one and two, except you can drop two in this case if it's, uh, if it's uh, so it's just the non existence of subshifts of E. Of, uh, of, higher, of slope bigger than zero um, is equivalent to non-existence of uh, subshifts of par parabolic, maximal parabolic subalgebra. It's a equivalent condition. 
of the NDE. All right, so, so it's stable. So the proof, the sketch of proof is the following. So the, the, so it has step, uh, step one, uh, and, and I'll be brief. So I'll state, uh, I'll state it's that, uh, so we uh, the, the vector bundle, I'll explain why it's believable. Vector bundle, L pair modulo L does not have, so this is over D. Right, over the exceptional divisor of the blob of the diagonal, does not have any uh, subshift, no, uh, non-zero subshift of a uh, rank less than 2n minus 2. Why is this believable? So you see, the, the tangent bundle of a hyperkeller manifold is... Uh, uh, is is uh, stable is is um, hyperholomorphic, and uh, and uh, strictly less than the rank of e, the rank less than two and minus two, which is the rank of e. It's weird because you are on a non-algebraic, so 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 take. Take a, a generic hyperkeller. The tangent bundle doesn't have if it doesn't have any subshift because the Picard is trivial. Uh, so the tangent bundle of the K3 it boils down to the fact that the tangent bundle of the K3 doesn't have any any line sub bundles or, or rank one subshifts. Why? Because um, it, it has slope zero. The Picard is trivial, so every rank one subshift will have slope zero, so it will destabilize the tangent bundle. So <laughs> That's it. So it's a, it, it's a proof by induction, basically using the fact that the tangent bundle of the K3 doesn't have. Um, I, so, so this is, and now the, the second step is clear. Uh, step two, uh, let, so, so you have this, uh, if you have a subshift of E, you will have a subshift of V. And so uh, let, uh, let uh, W uh, be a subshift of V of intermediate rank. I, we want to show that there are no, V doesn't have any intermediate in rank. Uh, we may assume uh, that uh, W is saturated. So reflexive, because V is locally free, uh, the, uh, then, it's, then it's locally free away from a locus of co-dimension 3. So W restricts to uh, D, the exceptional divisor, maps to uh, V restricted to D, which is isomorphic to L pair of modulo L. Uh, as uh, with the uh, image, with image uh, of the same rank as W. A contradiction, uh, because by step one, this contradicts step one. So V does not have uh, any subshifts, but uh, away, that means that E doesn't have because they coincide away from the diagonal. All right, so I guess I need to clean. So we have stability for, for Hilbert scheme of very non-algebraic K3s. Uh, and in fact, I, I'll just uh, mention it briefly that we also have stability when the, the Brouwer class uh, is uh, of maximal order. This already happens for moduli spaces of sheaves, not of Hilbert schemes. But uh, if, uh, if you don't have a universal sheaf, you have only a twisted universal sheaf, one can check that uh, the, the Brouwer class of the twisted universal sheaf uh, has, in general, order. 
uh, it could, could have order uh, 2n minus 2, which is the rank of E, and then it follows that the Brouwer class of E, which is essentially uh, the Brouwer class uh, uh, pullback from each factor of the Brouwer class of the universal shift, uh, but with uh, inverting one, one of them, uh, also have order 2n minus 2, and then you get stability for free of the shift E. So when, when the modular space M has maximal a uh, maximally twisted universal shift is automatically stable. That's another way. That's the original way. So, oh, gosh. I'm sorry, I'm very slow. All right, so the next thing that uh, I need to prove, so we want to show that E is uh, hyperholomorphic. So the next thing is to show that uh, the C2 of C2 of and E uh, remains uh, uh, remains of Hodge type C2 along any twist of deformation. And in fact, we will show that C2. So the, 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 the method, the strategy, which is a much stronger statement, is to show that C2 of and E is invariant under an index two subgroup. of the monodromy group of, let's say, Sn, doesn't matter, or any other modular space. So, so I, want to, I would like to explain it. Uh, once you have this and you have stability, you have that it's hyperholomorphic. OK? Mm. All right. So, uh, so I'll, uh, let me explain. Uh, so we have. So remember, this is the topological K group of the K3. It's isomorphic to the Mukai lattice. Uh, so it's uh, the same as uh, the total cohomology with integral coefficients uh, under the Chern uh, or the Chern times the Todd class. And we have the Mukai pairing on, on both. Um, and and so we get the group, or the isometry group of the Mukai lattice. It's a, I, there is a reason why I, I use this notation. And there is a certain sign, uh, I'll call it uh, O plus, and I don't, uh, every speaker is exempt from dealing with signs in a talk, so I will not explain what this sign is. Um, and then you have here a V, for example, this could be, just for concreteness, we can talk about SL. So this is the Mukai vector of the ideal shift of n points. And so uh, in here, we have the stabilizing subgroup of the Mukai vector, sub v, and I'll call this gamma. Ah. This is uh, a group. And uh, uh, so there is a theorem. It's kind of old theorem already by now. Uh, uh, so there exists an, let's see, do I, yeah, this is part one. There exists a natural uh, ho injective homomorphism. Mu for monodromy, mu from uh, this group gamma to the monodromy. I would like to explain this, actually, because that's why the C2 is monodromy. Uh, monodromy of Sn, let's say. It's true for any moduli space. Uh, and the, uh, the image. No, no, because uh, it's not monodromy of S. 
monodromy of SN. Gamma is uh, in the Mukai lattice of S. And in fact, gamma shifts degrees, you know. So it cannot be a monodromy of the surface, but uh, it's related. So the image is uh, an index two subgroup if uh, n is bigger than or equal to three, and the whole thing, the whole, uh, the whole thing, if n is two, uh, and two. Okay, so this uh, will be a mouthful, but I'll explain. So the choice of a universal shift, so this is true for any M. Any, actually, it's really good to talk about any, to think about a general moduli space. For the, for the Hilbert scheme, you have a natural choice of a universal shift, the ideal shift of the universal subscheme. So, but for a general moduli space, you don't. The choice of a universal shift involves a choice. It's, a unique, uh, it's canonical up to tensoring by a line bundle. So the choice of a possibly twisted universal shift uh, of uh, S cos M uh, determines a map so what I'm going to uh, the ne uh, this part maybe I'll give it a title this is a a equivariance, but in quotation mark, equivariance it's actually an automorphic property of the class of the this is the class of the universal shift. This is the class either the churn character or the class in the topological K group on S cross M. So that's what I'm going to state, but it takes uh, something to state because it's not exactly equivalent. Because the choice is not natural, it's natural only up to a line bundle. So what I'm going to say next is related to the fact that it's, it's, it's a canonical up to a line bundle. So the choice of a universal sheaf determines a map L from gamma to H2 of the modular space with integral coefficients. And the way I think about it, you know, if this were, was H11, this would be peak. But I think about this as the group of topological complex line bundle. Line bundle. And it takes a, and this is an isometry. What is this? This is here an isometry of the Mukai lattice preserving the Mukai vector of the moduli space. And it sends it to some topological line bundle on the, on the mod modular space. Wh and what is, this, uh, what is the defining property of this L such that? All right, so now you see G is an isometry of the Mukai lattice. So G, so we have the, the topological K group of S cross M. And here, uh, the universal shift defines a class here. Even if it's twisted, but I don't want to bother about it. Now, this, uh, you can t think about, if you don't like topological K group, think about the Chern character. And then you have the Kuhnert decomposition, the, the level of cohomology. Oh, you actually have Kuhnert decomposition also in topological K theory. And so, now, G is, by definition, an isometry of the Mukai lattice. And mu, mu of G, which I'll explain how, uh, roughly how it's constructed, mu of G is, uh, maybe I'll denote it also by mu sub G. It's, uh, it will be, is a, a monodromy operator of KM. So the, the pair, the tensor product, acts on both, on the whole thing. So it makes sense to talk about G tensor mu sub G. And this goes uh, to itself. And you would love to have that the class of the universal shift is sent to itself, but actually that's not quite true. Um, and this sends the class of the universal shift to the class of the universal shift tensor 
the class of the topological line bundle LG. So there is a, such a map. All right, that's the statement of the theorem. Uh, so this is a this is a key point. So I want to I wanted to explain it, but I ran out of time. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm four out of nine pages. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well. So I want to, in the last five minutes, I'll just explain why this is true. So uh, you know, because this is the, the, this is the reason why this uh, E deform. So let me explain why. Uh, so remember what we wanted to say, that the Chern class of E remains of, uh, of uh, type 2, 2. So first of all, what this says, so a corollary of this, it's a little computation that if you look at the, I still, I wanted to describe the construction of this mu g, but if you take mu g, uh, tensor mu g, now this goes from uh, m cos m to, because we are interested in E, and we have the class of E here. And it turns out that this is sent to uh, the class of E tensor uh, pi 1 upper star of LG inverse tensor pi 2 upper star of LG. And so you see that, that the, the, now when you pass to the A, which is the endomorphism of E, it's C2. is a G invariant, is a mu G, a tensor mu G invariant. That's what we wanted, if you believe that mu exists, invariant. And, uh, and in fact, much, is m much more holds if you take the class of E and you tensor it to the power 2 and minus 2, and then you tensor it by the determinant of uh, E, which is a line bundle inverse. This class in topological K theory is invariant. So all its chern classes are invariant. Using these chern classes, we construct, we, we prove with uh, Francois Charles the standard conjectures for, for hyperkähler varieties of type K3, K, K3n. So this uh, gives you a construction of uh, characteristic classes which are automatically algebraic whenever the, uh, the, the formation of M is projective. Um, so because uh, now, what, oh gosh. So uh, I started maybe, uh, so let's see, I have uh, three minutes. Okay, so I have a choice to do. So I guess I need to, uh, so I will not explain the construction of mu. Uh, watch it. I should, I should. All right. So, uh, so what's the? No, what do I should? I guess I'll play with water. <laughs> so, what do we get? We get that E. Now, finally, we establish that E is hyperholomorphic. What do you, and Verbitsky's theorem? That was the motivating uh, theorem tells us that we can deform it along twist all lines. So in fact, you can, you can start with the E over Sn cos Sn, where, where e, you know that it's hyperholomorphic, it's stable, so you'll take a K3 which, is, which has trivial Picard group. And so, uh, so you start with, a, a, remember, uh, Sukendu talked about the modular space M of marked pairs. And we, he also had a, a modular space M tilde of marked triples. So this was, uh, this was a deformation X, uh, the, uh, this is the formation of the Hilbert scheme, and the marking on its H2, and this was X, 
את השיפר בזומיה אלג'ברה, which is a deformation of our, our end E. And one of the main thing is that this forgetful morphism forget is uh, subjective and generically injective. So let me just explain why it's subjective and that's it. So I will uh, run uh, two more minutes over time. So you start with a, you start with a point S N uh, with a marking in uh, your modular space of marked pairs. <coughs> now, given uh, if you choose a Keller class, give, if, if you choose a Keller class of, on Sn, you get the twist of family And, uh, and this corresponds, the fact that you can deform, uh, this is, uh, this is three, uh, locally, uh, this is simply connected the base, so you get a uh, marking for three, for the all fibers, and so you get a lift of P1, you get a lift, this, just the family gives you a lift of P1 into M, right? Of the base, the classifying morphism. And it's injective, uh, uh, it's in, it actually, it is injective because it injects into the period domain. So this is actually injective. It's easy to see. So you have a notion of a twist or line in the modular space of marked pairs. So these, uh, these are P1s in the modular space of marked pairs. So this is, here's your M, and you have the point, uh, your, your Hilbert scheme, eta, and you, you have another point, x, which is marked. So what do you do? You take a twist or line, and, um, and then you take here a point, a point which is, this is a point. So you take this generic. You have the freedom of choosing omega. You take a, a point, point, uh, I'll call this x. So this would be x, or this would be y. This would be x naught by definition, uh, eta naught, and you'll take a point x1, eta1, such that peak x1 is trivial. And then it, our Azumayo algebra over Sn cos Sn we have a, will deform along the self-product. So we are deforming Azumayo algebras of, over self-products of a uh, twist of families. It will deform to a, an Azumaya algebra of x1 cross x1, so you'll get a1. And since the Picard here is trivial, it will, you'll get that the Brouwer class of this a1 has order which is the rank of a1. So it will it'll be automatically stable with respect to every Keller class. So you can deform it along any twist or line you choose. So you take another twist or line here and another until and there is an easy statement that um, uh, due to Verbitsky originally, but follows trivially from Torelli, that any two points in moduli can be connected via generic twist or paths. The genericity is the, uh, that there is always a, the connecting points uh, has trivial Picard. And so you can re so that means that, that that tells you the subjectivity. You can deform A from here to one on A. Okay, I'm sorry, I ran out of time and I didn't have Time to explain other aspects. Thank you very much. statement about this there is this uh, so this gives us a deformation of the of the end of functor but we had the natural transformations uh, the core unit and the core multiplication 
And these uh, need to satisfy the uh, compatibility axioms for uh, like the co-associativity and this. And, uh, and uh, so uh, for the, to verify them using a density argument, we needed to, uh, the statement that they belong to sections of line bundles. Uh, and such that the composition also belongs to a section of a line bundle. This harm from F to the triple convolution of F in Sukendu's talk. So uh, it's true over the open set in moduli, well, this is a line bundle, which uh, it is true along a uh, um, over an open set containing all Hilbert schemes which are dense in uh, moduli. So, so the, the endo is okay Yes. The, yes, 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 exactly. And, uh, uh, and there was a technical issue, the star in Sukendu. I didn't get to it. <laughs> if you want, I can say. Uh, there is that, uh, that, so there is an injectivity here. We want phi, where is it? This phi. We want this to be generically injective in some sense. For this, we need a technical statement about um, the formations along twist of family. So you start with A here, and you deform it uh, over the whole twist of family. Now, we know, as Sukendu mentioned, that A is rigid uh, on a fixed, uh, on Sn cos Sn, it doesn't uh, have inf even infinitesimal deformation. The question is, does the deformation along the twister line results uh, on a different fiber or necessarily in a rigid uh, <coughs> as my algebra? It is true for locally, it's a theorem of um, Verbitsky that for locally free hyperholomorphic sheaves, the dimension of all the x, x and all the cohomology are constant. So if it's zero at the beginning, it's zero elsewhere. And uh, it is also true that uh, if there are deformations that are necessarily obstructed, it's also a theorem of Verbitsky, but we don't know that the, the x between the twisted sheaf to itself uh, elsewhere is zero. This uh, is needed even to prove that this is a manifold. So it's needed in the construction and it, it's needed for the injectivity. So that's, and Verbitsky told, promised me that he's working on it. So, <laughs> on this. Thank you.